5 Watt World is supported in part by TrueFire. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide improve their playing using TrueFire's online lesson systems. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where it's to help you get the most music from the least gear. To understand the history of the electric guitar, you have to understand the history of archtop guitars. And at the heart of the history of electric archtop guitars is the history of the Gibson L5. I think when we see an archtop guitar these days, we think jazz guitar. But the L5 is as big a part in the growth of country, blues, R&B, and rock. Maybell Carter, Scotty Moore, B.B. King, Wes Montgomery, Eric Clapton, and John Mayer have all used L5s to make history was the drive to electrify archtop guitars that led to all the electric guitars we have today. And though there's many important archtops in that history, none goes further back or played a bigger role in all the genres than the Gibson L5. To learn that history, stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World short history of the Gibson L5. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe. YouTube tells me that 60% of you that watch my videos aren't subscribed, and I'd like to change that. So subscribe today. If you've already subscribed, swing by the store to grab a Stomp preset pack, t-shirt, or a hoodie to support what we're doing here. And if you want to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, think about becoming a friend of 5 Watt. The links are in the description. Orville Gibson was born in far northern New York State in 1856. By the 1870s, he'd moved his family to Kalamazoo, Michigan. And while he was working as a clerk in a shoe store, he continued to learn the instrument making business on his own. Soon demand for his instruments outstripped his short hours and small workshop. A local group of businessmen helped him incorporate the Gibson Mandolin Guitar Company in 1902. Orville was always more interested in designing and building instruments than in running a company, and by his death in 1918, he'd gone from being a manager to being a consultant at Gibson. It was always Orville's belief that the best resonance came from unstressed and unbent carved instruments. This carried through his mandolin and guitar line, and they were the favorite instruments of the mandolin orchestras that were so popular from 1904 to 1924. Orville had pioneered the arch-topped instrument, but it was Lloyd Lore that would first adopt the F-hole construction in other string instruments to guitar and mandolin designs in the early 1920s. Lore had a master's degree in music, was a virtuoso mandolinist and composer, and was a highly respected acoustical engineer. This combination of musical ability and engineering knowledge helped him to change the world of instruments forever. As a mandolin player, it makes sense that he first added the F-holes to his mandolin designs. Gibson often shared successful features between instrument lines, and we see the parallel top braces, maple necks, bound tortoise shell pickguards, and newly patented truss rod designs of the mandolin brought directly to the guitars. The raised fretboard design in the lower mandolin was also carried over, increasing the amount of the top that could resonate on the guitar. Even cosmetic details like the flower pot inlays on the peg head of the F5 mandolin can be found on the first L5. The lower L5 was a completely new direction in guitar design that allowed the guitar to step out from being an instrument used only for accompanying a vocalist and into the rhythm section of an ensemble or orchestra. It was these carved top instruments that would pave the way for all our chops to come from John D'Angelico, Elmer Stromberg, and Epi Strathopolo at Epiphone. The first F-hole L5s were simple instruments with dot inlay fingerboards and a classic dark sunburst finish. But there were also the pearly flower pot inlay below the Gibson scroll logo, and there was a carrot at the end of the fingerboard. There was just one guitar built close to the end of 1923. All production lore L5s were produced in 1924. It's unclear how many guitars were built in 24 and bear Lore's label. I spoke with vintage instrument expert Larry Wexer in New York about L5 history, and he told me that he has seen guitars dated being built in 24, but were shipped as late as 1926. Players like Nick Lucas, Eddie Lang, and Roy Smack embraced them in the dance bands at the time. But it wasn't just jazz bands at the time that embraced the new style of guitar. In 1928, just one year after the Carter family made their first recordings in Bristol, Tennessee, Mother Maybelle Carter bought a 1928 L5. She would play the guitar on recordings that would become the foundation of country music. Vintage instrument dealer George Grun said, I consider this to be the most important guitar in the course of country music history. 
Check out bluegrass guitarist Molly Tuttle playing its 1924 L5 like Maybell's. <laughs> Moore's interest in innovation quickly led to frustrations with the company bureaucracy at Gibson, and in 1924 he left. But before he left, he'd cemented a number of new features. The carved and graduated top and back, an angled neck with adjustable bridge, the violin F-holes, and the use of a metal tailpiece to secure the strings and increase the sustain. Like many things with early Gibson, it's impossible to precisely date the changes in the design because they were ongoing as instruments were built. It was named the L5 because it was the fifth production archtop the company had offered. The lower bout was 16 inches across, and there was a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length that came directly from the earlier F4 model. The top was carved from two pieces of spruce, and the back and sides were book match maple. Though not large by contemporary terms, the 16 inch lower bout was large for its time, and it provided more volume than was possible with earlier round sound hole archtops. On the heels of Laura leaving Gibson in 24, the years between 25 and 30 saw a number of changes to the model. The tuners were changed over to Waverly's. The logo was moved to being horizontal on the peghead. From 1930 to 37, the third version of the guitar saw more changes. The most visible was a move from the dot markers to block perloid inlays on the fingerboard. In 34, a new advanced version was introduced with a 17-inch body size and the carrot at the end of the fingerboard returned. The logo was changed from the Gibson to simply Gibson. They moved to using a larger ebony bridge, though many still got the original compensated rosewood bridge. And the pickguard was lengthened and screwed directly to the top. At the start of the 1930s, there was one archtop model in the Gibson line, but by 1935, there were nine different models. Much of this growth can be attributed to the growth of competitors Epiphone, Gretsch, and Harmony, offering guitars at different price points. Gibson, unsurprisingly, wanted a piece of each of those markets as well. The biggest competitor by far was Epiphone, who began a battle of the wits, introducing their 1934 Deluxe model at 3 8 inch wider than the 16-inch L5. Gibson, of course, answered with that 17-inch Advance model, and eventually with the 18-inch Super 400. In 37, the new larger F-holes were bound for the first time on the bodies and the new larger guitars. The advanced guitars were also moved from Grover tuners to Cluson seal fast to machines with internal lubrication. Another very visible change was the move from a trapeze tailpiece to a larger tailpiece with flat brass sections. It evolved over a couple of years into the Veritone spring-loaded adjustable tailpiece. Gibson settled into using this design for the next 36 years. Whether out of engineering merit or out of inertia, we'll never know. The advanced model was very popular. To take advantage of the new size, volume, and upscale looks, the Carter family bought one of the new advanced model L5s and would go on to play later models as well. Nat King Cole's guitarist, Oscar Moore, was featured in Gibson advertising with a natural non-cutaway model with a Charlie Christian pickup installed by the factory. The other significant change with the advanced model was after the first few guitars were built, they moved to 25 and a half inch scale length. This kept the L5 in line with the Super 400. In 39, Gibson introduced the L5 Premier, or L5P, an advanced model with a soft cutaway we now refer to as a Venetian as opposed to a sharper Florentine cutaway we'd see on the ES-175. While these were not the first cutaway guitars that were popular, they were the first archtop, F-hole cutaway guitars. The L5P just looked right, so right that over time this would become the predominant model and simply be called the L5C. 39 also saw the introduction of the natural finish option, this was a $10 upcharge for the clear finish because the builders had to select clear, unblemished pieces of wood to use to build the guitar. The natural finish was immediately more popular. In 1940, 40 natural finish L5Ps were sold, but only 11 sunburst ones were shipped. By the 40s, the L5 was a staple in jazz bands and orchestras, as well as many rhythm and blues players and blues players in smaller bands with the start of electrification.
partner with Truefire because I believe in what they do, using world-class teachers to create online lessons. I've used them for years and my playing always improves when I start a new course. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level player, Truefire has something to challenge and inspire you. When someone tells me their playing is in a rut, I always tell them to grab some lessons instead of immediately start shopping for a new guitar. I really like Truefire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Get 35% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 35 or like I have for many years, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. You can sample anything in the catalog with the All Access Pass and see what you want to learn next. I love their tagline, Learn, Practice, and Play with Truefire. I'd like to thank Truefire for our ongoing partnership and for their support on this video. After greatly curtailing instrument production during World War II, the L5 was one of the first guitars to be put back into production. Due to shortages in the ebony immediately following the war, a number of L5s were built between 47 and 49 with Brazilian rosewood fingerboards. Some were also built with the pre-1937 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length. In 1949, the signature script logo was changed to the modern Gibson logo with the downward tails on the G and the N. In 1944, Gibson was acquired by CMI, and in the subsequent years there were many changes that increased their success and competitiveness in the marketplace. Foremost of these changes was the appointment of Ted McCarty in 1948. Under McCarty, an additional 25 electric models would be introduced in the next 10 years. One of those models, released in 1949, was the Gibson ES5. The ES in the Gibson naming stood for Electric Spanish. Meant to be the electric version of the acoustic L5 model, the ES5 was the first model to offer three P90 style pickups. Instead of a pickup selector switch, it had individual volume knobs for each pickup. In 1955, this model would become the Switchmaster with a four position switch on the cutaway and separate volume and tone controls for each pickup. In 51, the first electric L5 was launched at the New York trade show, the L5 CES, along with the Super 400 CES. These were the top of the line Gibson electric guitar offerings at the time while being in a straight line electrics going back to the 30s with guitars like the ES100 and ES150. Those first L5 CES had two single coil P90 pickups. The controls were the now familiar three-way selector switch, two volume and two tone controls. This control set made such simple sense that it was immediately adopted on all two pickup electrics at the time. The two pickup guitars were very much like the earlier L5C but the top was carved a little thicker and the braces were made a little stouter to accommodate the routing in the top for the P90 pickups. From 53 to 57, there were subtle changes, the most notable of which was the move to a staple style of P90 pickup that had been developed by Seth Lover and was used on the Super 400, Les Paul Custom, Birdland, and L5 CES guitars. Also in 53, they modified the bridge from the rosewood they'd been using to a rosewood base with a new patent applied for Tunematic bridge. This metal bridge design allowed for subtle adjustments of intonation for each string. While the P90 was of course a single coil pickup and prone to noise inherent in that design, many players embraced this new model in the Alnico 5 pickups. Scotty Moore, the lead guitarist with Elvis Presley, is famous for his Gold ES295, but he also was one of the best known players of an early P90 version of the L5 with his 54 L5 CESN. Wes Montgomery made his first recordings using the newer Alnico 5 pickups in his early L5s. Wes is said to have liked the slightly more hi-fi sound of the new staple P90 pickup. By far the most famous musician associated with the L5 and in no doubt responsible for the jazz community embracing the model as the ultimate jazz guitar, Montgomery was featured in an advertisement for the model. Montgomery's early records leaned towards hard bop, soul jazz, and post bop, but in 65 he began recording more pop-oriented records, covering contemporary songs and using a string orchestra, and his music found wide success. Wes would die of a heart attack in 1968 at just 45 years old, but his impact on the jazz community, and particularly jazz guitarists, lasts until today. Gibson would build custom single pickup L5s for Wes, and this would later lead to a signature model. With Montgomery's influence, West Coast jazzers in particular flocked to the L5 CES. Kenny Burrell used one before moving to an ES-175. 
Another important player influenced by Wes's guitar choice was a young Pat Martino, who played a number of L5 CES guitars in both cutaway styles. The race to produce hum-canceling pickups ended at Gibson in 1957. Seth Lever's humbucker began to be used on all the premium guitars in the range, relegating the P90 to lower end and student models. The more expensive to manufacture Alnico 5 pickup was discontinued at that time. The new humbuckers were quiet by design, but were also much less prone to feedback in an archtop guitar design because they were suspended from a pickup ring and not screwed directly to the top of the guitar. This allowed the PAF humbucking equipped L5 CES to be played at much higher volumes without incident. A small but important change came around the time of the pickup change. The surround on the selector switch had a rubber grommet added that would help minimize the vibration in the top when the switch was used. Effectively, it made pickup changes quieter in the archtop guitars, and it was adopted on the other models in the range for this reason. The original non-cutaway L5 version was discontinued in 1958 due to declining sales. The next big change came in 1960, when the cutaway style was changed from the rounded or Venetian cutaway to the sharper Florentine cutaway that we'd seen on the 175. This change is sometimes credited to Kenny Burrell and sometimes to Ted McCarty himself. Whichever the case may be, the majority of L5 CES cutaways built between 62 and 69 have the sharper Florentine cutaway. Interesting, the acoustic L5Cs built during this time had the softer cutaway, but with most things at Gibson in the early years, this is not a hard and fast rule. Montgomery, for one, is famously pictured on the cover of Movin' West, carrying a Florentine cutaway L5 CES. Still distinctly different than the very popular ES-175 is the L5 CES Florentine was a larger guitar and had the longer scale length. In 1960, gold caps were added to the bonnet knobs carrying the words volume and tone, and serial numbers began to be pressed into the back of the headstock. In 62, they moved to a three-piece maple neck with a walnut stripe down the center. In the early 60s, the backs began to be made of two-piece plywood laminate, though some solid back guitars were still randomly built. In the mid-60s, as the world turned towards semi-solid guitars like the ES-335, sales of the L5s dipped. But by 68, shipping numbers of L5s had increased again, from a total of 60 guitars in 65 to 314 guitars in 68. In 65 and 66, they moved to larger sombrero-style knobs. In 69, Gibson moved back to the softer Venetian cutaway style, but the new cutaway was slightly deeper than the original. By the end of the transition in cutaway, Gibson would be owned by Norlin, and more changes were coming. The headstocks had increased in size over the years, and in 68-69, there was a move back to a smaller style headstock. The sunburst colors on the L5s had morphed over the years from a dark two-tone to a three-tone brown-red-yellow, and now the light cherry burst of the Les Paul Deluxe and Barney Kessel models made its way over to the L5 CES. This would stay until the mid-70s when, due to demand, a tobacco sunburst and a vintage sunburst option was added. After that strong year in 68, demand steadily dropped, and by 73-74, they shipped fewer than 10 guitars, as Gibson's archtop history was completely eclipsed by Norland's interest in cranking out greater number of less well-appointed Les Pauls. Like other models in the Gibson catalog, the Norland years are a litany of eroding specifications, cost-cutting, and compromise. Interestingly, the move away from archtop guitars led to a solid body L5S. Introduced in 1972, the L5S was marketed as a solid body version of the L5 CES. In keeping with the history, it was placed at the top of the range with all the binding, gold hardware, and inlay one would expect from a model at the top of the Gibson line. A number of variants of the guitar were built, but despite high profile users like John McLaughlin, Pat Martino, Ron Woods, Keith Richards, and Mark Farner of Grand Funk Railroad, the model was never popular, and after many evolutions, the number shipped dwindled and the model was dropped in 85. In 1986, Norland sold the Ailing Gibson Company to Henry Juskowitz and Partners. In hindsight, Henry's leadership of the company was at best mixed. These efforts would eventually lead to the founding of the Gibson Custom Shop, a legacy that we all still benefit from this day. 
Effectively a guitar company within a guitar company, the custom shop began putting out interesting historically motivated L5s. They issued a replica of the 34 non-cutaway L5, an L5 CES model after an example from 51, and a single pickup West Montgomery model. Like most replica programs, though of very high quality, these guitars are not exact replicas of the originals, of course. As a top-of-the-line guitar, Gibson L5s were always produced in relatively small numbers, often effectively being built as custom instruments and never having the numbers of even the fabled Sunburst Les Pauls of the late 50s. Despite their correct and broad association with jazzers, the L5 proved itself to be a very flexible guitar, being used in many different genres. There's no doubt that they were some of the finest guitars ever built by Gibson, and they are rightly collected by connoisseurs for that reason. If I missed your favorite part of the Gibson L5 story, please put it in the comments for everyone to enjoy. I know from experience that I can count on you. First, I need to thank Andy Bowen and the guys at ATB Guitars in Cheltenham, England, for the intro and outro music used in the video. Andy for his great playing, and ATB for loaning Andy the 1953 L5 CES he used in the video. I've been using picks of vintage guitars from ATB for years, and they are clearly one of the premier vintage dealers in the world. Andy runs a great YouTube channel called Jazz Guitar with Andy, where he puts out weekly content. Check it out. Oh, and last I knew, that guitar is still for sale at ATB. The link's in the description. I once again need to thank Carter Vintage Guitars for their permission to use clips of amazing musicians playing the amazing vintage guitars that pass through their doors. I need to thank my new friend Tim Lurch for his permission to use clips of him playing various L5s. I've always been impressed by Tim's playing and his clear teaching style. Check out his courses on Truefire. I need to thank my script editor Perry McManus for working on a script about a non-strat shaped object between study sessions in Tim's new book. Kidding aside, he always adds something that I didn't see coming. I need to thank everyone that stopped by the store and picked up some merch or the Stomp Preset Pack. Check out the new Caught Between shirts with our tagline on the front and a tongue-in-cheek version of the tagline on the back that's been popular among friends of Five Watt for a long time. It made me laugh just putting it together. In particular, I need to thank the friends of Five Watt. It's the guitar community I've always wanted. Join us for exclusive live streams and early access to videos. If you enjoyed this short history of the Gibson L5, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. Thanks for watching. Until next time, I'm Keith Williams. Thanks for being a part of the 5-Watt world.